Hi, this is John with the Everyday Bible Study, and uh, we're trying out a new lighting uh, situation here, trying to do some indoor filming uh, since it's getting too cold to do these uh, particular videos outside. I like doing them in nature, but that was a thing that we just can't do this time of year on most occasions. And uh, I just hope that these uh, lights don't blind you from my glasses if I get the wrong angle going. But uh, we're, we're trying this out and the light is very bright. And it might make it a little hard to read the scripture because of the angles. But uh, we're going to give it a try anyway. We're in the book of Luke. And that's uh, the story of Jesus Christ. It's told by the physician Luke. And we're in the fifth chapter, and Jesus is just getting his ministry started. He had started it in the previous chapter, and uh, we're looking at the early part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And uh, starting with uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, On one occasion, when the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked to be put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking to Simon, uh, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. Now can you imagine how difficult it would be uh, if this was your job and your job was as a professional fisherman? And uh, the fish would, I don't know, it seems like even here in the mountains of Kentucky, the fish a lot of times will bite better at night. And of course now they weren't, you know, using a, a line and a bait to catch the fish. They were using nets. But uh, in the evenings, uh, as the evenings cooled down, uh, the fish would rise to the surface. They'd stay deep a lot of times if the water was warm uh, during the daytime. And... Uh, uh, a lot of the things that they would eat be down there. It would also be more comfortable for them. But as the evenings would cool down, they'd, they'd come closer to the surface. They'd also come closer to the surface because uh, there'd be a lot of activity, uh, nocturnal activity, insects, and things that they could eat. And uh, so uh, that would be the time that would be the easiest for the fishermen to uh, actually uh, catch the fish in the nets. And uh, they would actually, they were commercial fishermen. They fished for a living, sold the fish, and that's how they made their living. And um, I would imagine that the Sea of Galilee was a uh, very fertile uh, uh, lake there. Uh, it was actually a, more of a lake than a sea. It wasn't like the Mediterranean Sea, which is, you know, very ocean-like. But it was, a, it was a large lake, and it was large enough to have storms that would come up on it. But uh, it uh, was apparently a very good place to fish. And uh, anyway, um, he let down his nets in, in for catch. And uh, anyway, Simon answered Jesus and said, Master, we've told all night and we took nothing. But at your word, I will let down my nets. So he had some lack of faith as to what Jesus was telling him. And, uh, you know, he's thinking, well, it's daytime now. The fish are going to be going down toward the bottom. And uh, it's not the best time to catch uh you know, very many fish, especially if you fished all night and we just can't catch anything. And uh, so he signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and, uh, so excuse me, and when they had done this, they had enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. Needless to say, they got a good catch. And uh, that's, a, that's some amazing fishing right there, that their nets were breaking and their boats were full to the point where the boats could be sinking. And, uh, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he knew all who were with him were astonished at the catch that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were the partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. I mean, this was so such a bizarre thing that happened, this miracle uh, where they caught this many fish that uh, it uh, was something that never happened in the natural. And it had brought them fear. But um, anyway, um, 
Jesus told them, do not be afraid. And by the way, I think we've mentioned this in the earlier episodes, that is the most common command that is in the Bible. It's in the Bible 365 times. And you know, uh, God is love. And uh, if we trust in him, the Bible tells us that true love casts out all fear. So here we see Jesus uh, doing something just amazing from God. Uh, and he performed a miracle in front of them, and it brought them fear because they did not understand it. But Jesus told them, don't, don't be afraid. But the next thing he told them was even more amazing than that. He told them, from now on, you will be catching men. Uh, that might sound kind of weird because maybe, he, maybe uh, at this time, Simon or James or John didn't really even understand what he was talking about. But when they had brought their boats to the land, uh, they left everything and followed him. Doesn't even say what they did with the fish. I don't know if they, you know, put them back into the sea or uh, they prepared them and took them with them. But uh, uh, that, that job, you know, Jesus had made them very, very good fishermen, but he was going to make them very, very good fishermen of men. They were going to be fishing for souls. And uh, Jesus came to the world uh, to save uh, the individuals in the world. Uh, to bring salvation, and uh, so now he was going to make them into Christian evangelists, and it was a much greater role. You know, fish, being a fisherman at the time was considered a fairly common profession, and it didn't take a lot of uh, uh, cerebral skills. Uh, it, it was a good craft, and it was something that you had to learn. You would probably do that uh, under... Uh, neath a uh, senior fisherman if you were a young, younger person and you know you could learn a craft or a skill uh, just like Jesus did uh, he under his father as he learned the skill of being a, uh, a skilled carpenter but uh, it wasn't something that uh, uh, was looked very highly upon even though uh, you know it would be much like a farmer uh, you know it's a very important role because they would be providing the food stuff that everybody ate but um, they uh, uh, sometimes were possibly looked down upon. But Jesus was going to give them the most important role of all uh, for a common person, and that was to be a preacher or someone sharing the gospel, and uh, that they were going to fish for the souls of men. So he's inviting them into his supernatural ministry. And uh, just imagine if God invited you to go with him and to share the good news. And uh, that's just exactly the invitation that they were given. And they accepted it. And not only did they accept it, but they didn't wait around and think about it. Uh, they just decided, well, I'm going to give up my point of living. This is better. And uh, it, uh, it it's an amazing act of faith that happened there with uh, Peter, James, and John. But uh, we see that they did this. And uh, uh, they did it gladly in their heart. Because they realized that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was a miracle worker. And, uh, you know, when he told them to do something, uh, they got excited about it. And that's the way we should get do about our faith, too. When, when the Word of God tells us to do something, and the Holy Spirit convicts us to do something, it should get us excited. And we should be participating in that. Now we're going to see Jesus do something else that's very exciting. And we're going to see one of Jesus' healings. Uh, verse 12 says, while he was uh, in one of the cities, there came a man with leprosy. And leprosy was a terrible disease. It still is a terrible disease, but now it's curable. Um, because it's primarily, um, I believe, bacterial in nature. And, uh, but uh, leprosy, uh, it's, it's, it's really, really terrible. Because what it does is it causes you to lose uh, your feeling. Um, if you get leprosy and it gets into your nerves, then uh, you no longer, you know, if like you suck your hand in the fire, there would be no pain. Uh, and you could have very serious injuries, and those injuries would not properly heal. And uh, you could lose fingers, you could lose limbs. Um, of course, uh, it was contagious as well, so you could spread this from one person to another. And uh, if a uh, person was a leper, uh, the Old Testament law instructed him to go to the priest 
and uh, the priest would observe him for a period of days and then determine whether or not he had leprosy. And during that time, he could not be with his family. And if he was determined that he had leprosy, he had to be separated from his family for the rest of his life. Uh, so just imagine a worker has a, um, um, uh, uh, let's say sores or whatever on his hand that did not heal. And then um, his wife took a look at it and said, um, you know, uh, you need to go to the priest and let the priest check him out. And the priest would uh, uh, set him aside for a number of days where he didn't see his family and separate him from his family to keep them from getting the infection if he had it. And uh, then if the infection spread, you know, say it spread up his arm or whatever, then apparently he had touched someone who had leprosy and uh, had caught this disease. And uh, then he would lose his job. He would never be able to hug his wife again, never be able to touch his children. And uh, would be usually part of a leper colony, a group of people. And people would bring them food, but then they would back away from them. And uh, they couldn't get close to the lepers in fear that uh, the lepers would give them this disease. And uh, then, you know, as time would go on and the disease spread, uh, they'd lose fingers, they'd lose toes, they might lose a nose, uh, and it could eventually lead to their death. And uh, they would be disfigured, and uh, it would just be a, a terrible way to live the rest of your life. And it was just like your life was almost over, even though you were still living if you were a leper. So les lepers were very desperate and very sick people. And But the sick, uh, part of the sickness was the fact that because of their illness, they were separated from society. And uh, they were looked down upon. Of course, nobody wanted to get a sickness that would lead to death. And so that was somewhat understandable. So it says here, when he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. So the leprosy was all over his body. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down on his face and he begged him, Lord, if you will, can you make me clean? Now this actually put Jesus at danger uh, if it had been in the natural. Because, um, you know, the man could have spread the leprosy to him or his disciples. But of course, Jesus had supernatural power. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. That's something you never do to a leper. Because, you know, then you could get the infection. But Jesus' reason for touching him was to spread healing. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So not only did he lose this disease, and was healed instantly from all these sores, and uh, you know maybe there were fingers that had fallen off, uh, maybe there was disfiguration on his face or the rest of his body, and uh, But here he realized that Jesus had healed him from this terrible disease. And uh, so immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but to go your, show yourself to the priest. Therefore the priest could recognize that the leprosy had been healed and, to make an, and, and could allow him to go back to his family and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went ab abroad. Because they already saw him, you know. And I'm sure the priests were telling, you know, people that uh, this guy got healed. And uh, family members were and friends were. You know, they thought they'd lost him. He was gone. He was in the leper colony. You know, they couldn't have anything to him. It's like, like somebody going to prison for the rest of their life for us. And uh, so now, even more, the report about them went abroad. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities because you know many people that were sick were coming to Jesus and Jesus was literally healing people by the hundreds or thousands and but he would draw to desolate places and pray and you know, the crowds would be overwhelming so Jesus would go to desolate places or I think one translation says the lonely places places where he could be alone where he could get together with God and to communicate with God the Father and to regain gain his strength. Now we're going to see one more um, healing here. And it says here, On one of these days, he was teaching. Um, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. 
So here we have the religious leaders, the ones that's supposed to be doing the teaching, but Jesus is teaching them. And they're very interested in him too. But as we find out later on in time, uh, they become very jealous of Jesus and uh, they want to destroy him. But uh, they did listen to him and they were very intrigued by what he had to say. And uh, said here uh, that they were there uh, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And um, it said here, Behold, some of the men uh, bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and to lay him before Jesus. Uh, and he was apparently inside a house at this time. Uh, but uh, finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. So, you know, probably there was such a big crowd in this house that the house was full. And then there was people all around the outside of the house, and they, they just couldn't get this man in. And he needed healing. Uh, they went up to the roof and let him down uh, with his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. Now, let me explain a little bit about the architecture of that day. Um, you know, we tend to have sloped roofs today, but uh, there in the desert, there's just not as much rain. And, um, uh, well, it was a tropical climate and somewhat desert-like climate. And uh, they had flat roofs as, as typical. And instead of having a porch, a lot of times what you do is you go upstairs and uh, you'd use the upstairs area like a, root, a, a porch. And uh, so uh, they had tiles and you could remove tiles on the roof and uh, then uh, you could have access to the inside of the house. And apparently this is what they were doing. And uh, so uh, um, they uh, says here that they went up on the roof and let down his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. So this created a spectacle. You know, Jesus here, he was teaching and healing inside this house. And then all of a sudden, these guys up on the roof, they open the roof up and they're, and they're lowering down the sick man. And because uh, that's the only way they could get him to Jesus. And uh, when they saw, uh, and when he saw their faith, uh, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And I'm sure he didn't say it like we do now. Like, uh, you know, you're back and said, man, your sins are forgiven. But he said, man, he's speaking to that man that they lowered down, said, your sins are forgiven. Because this right here actually showed what faith and to what extent uh, this man would come to get to Jesus. That should be our attitude, too. We need Jesus for our salvation. Sometimes we need healing. Or sometimes we need our mind healed or our spirits healed or our emotions healed. And, uh, you know, Christ is a great chain breaker. Sometimes we need our addictions healed. And Jesus has the ability to heal all those things. And he has the ability to change us from the inside out and make us a new creation in him. And uh, we should have that much excitement to try to get to Jesus. And um, But that's, that's actually kind of a rare thing. A lot of times people nowadays want to do what they can to try to avoid Jesus. And um, because uh, they're afraid uh, that Jesus would make them do something uh, to deal with their sins or give up their sins. And they love that sin. And uh, But here we see that these people loved him, and they wanted to be close to him, and they knew that he could change your life for the positive, and he still does that today. And we need to have that enthusiasm too. But he said, uh, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, began to uh, question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they were correct in saying that. Guess what? They just didn't realize that this was God in their midst, the Son of God. And Jesus later on would say, uh, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So uh, this was, uh, and they thought he was blaspheming God, you know, claiming to be God. But guess what? He was God. He was the Messiah. And they failed to recognize this. And uh, it says here that Jesus, and being God, perceived their thoughts. And he answered them and said, Why do you question in your hearts, which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up and pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on, and he went home, glorifying God. And the amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things. And you know, if we saw this today, uh, we would say, Wow, <laughs> this is extraordinary. You know, this guy's getting his house torn down uh, to bring in this, this sick man in, in this cot that's being lowered down by probably ropes and uh, because they couldn't get to Jesus. But Jesus heals him. And the religious leaders are, uh, you know, being upset about this and, you know, having hissy fits and saying he's a blasphemer and uh, he's uh, claiming to be God. Well, guess what? He was claiming to be God. And he was right. He was God. But they had God in their midst. But the Pharisees and the religious leaders uh, just uh, were so out of it that they could not realize that uh, wonderful things that were happening here and that God was alive. And, you know, I just uh, want to bring you into a period of prayer. And I hope you help. This These scriptures are helping you to have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is a miracle maker. And he actually, of all these miracles that he did, you know, uh, casting out demons and healing people and raising people from the dead, those are wonderful things. But the greatest miracle he does is he redeems us from our sin. He actually gives us a way uh, to God, to be reconciled to God. And uh, it's, that's the miracle thing that he does uh, for everybody that asks him. Everybody that wants to repent of their sin, turn away from their sin, and believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, believe that he died on the cross for our sin, paid the penalty, the debt for our sin that we could not pay, that God made a way for us to uh, be redeemed. Uh, he became the perfect sacrifice, blood sacrifice, gave up his blood and gave up his life uh, for our sins. And then he did that freely, by the way. He wasn't forced into it. But he did that because he loved us. And then he, on the third day, after he was in the grave, he rose from the dead and conquered over sin and death. And he still lives today in heaven. And he's coming back for his church, uh, which he refers to as his bride. And he's coming back for all the Christians uh, that believe in him. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing that God would love us so much that he'd go to these lengths in order to reconcile us, in order to save us. And the uh, Bible tells us about our sin. It says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he came uh, to show us his love and came to show us uh, his power and his ability to heal and uh, he wants to change us from the inside out and make us children of God. And uh, that's why this message is so important. That's why uh, uh, during the Christmas season, and we're just coming out of the Christmas season now. I'm actually recording this on Christmas Day. But um, during this season, uh, we see you know Jesus coming as a baby uh, into the lowliest uh, form, even though he's a king in heaven and uh, creator of the earth. But he came uh, to do all these wonderful things for us because of his great love for you. He loves you. And he wants you to be saved. And he wants for you to accept him as Lord and Savior. And to uh, allow him to be the Lord of your life. And to transform you. And to reconcile him to you. And show just so that he can love you. And have a relationship with you. In all those lonely times. And uh, so uh, I'm just praying that many people will see this and many people will believe on Christ and they will accept him as Lord and Savior. And salvation is available to everyone. The Bible tells us that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And just like he was healing everybody, he wants to save everybody. Now, not everybody will get saved. The uh, Bible tells us uh, that it's a narrow way and uh, the way to destruction is broad. And, you know, m most people will choose to uh, reject Jesus, and uh, they will turn him down. But God has provided a way uh, for us to be saved and to have eternal life uh, through him. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and thank you uh, for the love that you showed us by sending your Son 
uh, the very best uh, to come and to die for us and to live for us and teach us and to uh, do those things that are necessary to redeem us from our sins. And Lord, we pray that uh, as people watch this, that many will believe and many will accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and will be born again and be transformed from the inside out. And uh, this beautiful plan that you set up uh, so many years ago. And Lord, we just pray that you will build faith in those that hear uh, your word and they will exercise that faith and accept you and accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we just want to thank you for the power of your word. Uh, the fact that it is powerful when Jesus spoke it and it's powerful as we read it today and as we study it. And we know that you can use it to continue to transform us into the image of Christ. And we just want to thank you so much for this beautiful gift, this beautiful love letter that you sent us. And uh, we just pray that many, many people will use it uh, to get close to you. And Lord, we pray that many will be drawn uh, to your word and to the transformation that you intend. And Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for all the good things you do for us. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for joining the Everyday Bible Study. And uh, we just pray that you'll keep watching these and you'll just keep doing everything you can to get deep into the Word of God and let it transform you, let it transform your mind, transform your heart, transform your life. And we, you know, Jesus came to give us abundant life. And uh, we need to have more of him. And we need to get deep into this word. Uh, because in this word, we have access to the mind of God. And uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So until next time, this is John with the Everyday Bible Study. You have a very, very blessed day.